It's wonderful to be back here this morning. I think the last time I was here was just about the time this worship space was being dedicated, and I was a candidate for the presidency of our association. And when one of the things that my family and friends had to put up with was hearing me introduced everywhere as the evangelical rabbi of liberal religion, <laughs> title that was bestowed on me along with the, the stole and an honorary doctorate by the seminary that Eric went to, which provoked my daughter to send me a card that she found at college that year that had on it a drawing of a guy about my age and, and girth <laughs> with glasses in a well-traveled robe and the prayer shawl and wearing where the hair was all somehow lugged off on top, a little yarmulke, labeled the Velveteen Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> with the caption, so when do I get to go out and run and play with the real rabbis? <laughs> so as people like uh, Kathleen and Eric and Mark invite me to come preach and come play, as I will with your district summer institute this week at Kennedy College, who am I to say no? Religion is people. It may express itself as ideas, it may take form in groups and in institutions, leaders may develop, but before everything else, religion is people. Those are the first sentences in my newest book. Universalists and Unitarians in America, a people's history. It's called that because most previous histories treated Unitarianism and Universalism separately, although the two joined forces 50 years ago this, this summer. And most also focused either on ideas, since we were named for them, or on institutions, since being relatively small, we have been self-conscious about it. While without neglecting either, mine focuses just on people. Both the remembered and the forgotten, the known and the unknown. Because while our faith has produced more than its share of American notables, just listing luminaries is a little bit like looking up at the night sky and seeing there only the brightest stars. When in order to see the most interesting patterns, you must also discern the lights of second and third order magnitude. So let me give you just a couple of examples from our past, which somehow helped me understand the process of the hope. In the fateful year 1929, as the Great Depression was beginning, Time Magazine chose as its man of the year a universal. A layman named Owen D. Young. You probably don't even know his name today. But Will Rogers, the humorist who also famously said, I don't belong to an organized political party, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> Rogers said he wanted Owen D. Young to be the Democratic candidate for president in 1932 as the most likely to get us out of the Depression. Back then, Owen Young was known as perhaps the most progressive and effective business leader and peacemaker, an advocate for ordinary working people that American had. He'd grown up on a farm in the Mohawk Valley of upstate New York, near the village of Van Hornersville, a real crossroads. The little Universalist church in which he was raised made him superintendent of the Sunday school when he was all of 15. <laughs> that summer, a seminary student came to preach and was impressed with young Yo Owen and wrote to the president at St. Lawrence University, the Universalist College and Seminary, that it was a pity that Owen would never get to go to college being an only child needed on the family farm. 
and the president came down to the Van Hornersville in person to meet him and give him a scholarship and persuade his parents to let him go. He excelled at school. He married a fellow universalist. He became an attorney that specialized in public utilities, just as America was becoming electrified. And by the 1920s, he was chairman of the board of General Electric and the founder of RCA, and the founder and first chairman of NBC. Time Magazine, though, honored him as a peaceman, because he had gone twice to Europe to ask the victors in world, the Great World War to ease up on their reparation demands from Germany, seeing that those were likely to lead to a second war and were already provoking the rise of Hitler and Nazism. At GE, Owen Young provided not just pensions and disability and health insurance for all workers that later influenced the New Deal. He advocated not just for a living wage, but what he called a cultural wage that would be large enough for ordinary working people to improve their lives and that of their families through education and culture. He made generous pledges to cultural and religious institutions, including his hometown church, and funding the Universalist National Memorial Church in Washington, D.C., where the bell tower is named the Owen D. Young Peace Tower, and to his college, St. Lawrence, where the library is named for him, and to the first professional school for the study of foreign relations at Johns Hopkins and then the bottom fell out of the economy. Soon, Owen Young owed more in charitable pledges than he was probably worth. Rather than run for president himself, he sat his family down and said that they would never lack for education or basic security, but they shouldn't expect riches. His plan was to keep as many people employed as he could and to support Roosevelt for president and to keep his charitable pledges. He paid every penny, though it took him decades. And toward the end of his long life in the 1950s, Owen D. Young, universalist, could be seen some Sunday afternoons along Route 1 on Florida's east coast, selling breakthrough from his orchard at a roadside stand in front of his modest retirement home. I call him an unsung hero and a person of hope in a 